Greetings, my fellow Americans. Today I'm actually going to take a, a step back and try to explain some of what I've already said. And to be honest with you, this, this particular topic has actually got me a little bit riled up because I feel like if you know our country, if you know our rights, if you know our values, you already know this. So the, the necessity of taking a step back and having to explain this topic seems like it's almost a slap in the face. It's someone just saying so. So, big deal. And it's a huge deal. Maybe you're not affected by this. Maybe you're not. But the fact is, you can be. Everybody can be. Anybody can be where I am right now. Confined, my liberty suppressed, my ability to even travel outside the state of Montana, gone. I mean, all because someone doesn't want to be sued. Because they are the bad guys. They are the criminals. And you sit here and say, literally, what's the point? And that very question was asked to me about one of my previous videos. And it just, I've been meaning to do this, I was going to do this post on Saturday instead I'm posting this on Tuesday of this week. And this is actually the day after Labor Day in the United States, which was September 6th. So happy belated Labor Day to everybody out there. But I just feel like the necessity of having to take an entire podcast to talk about this just seems like, are you just really wanting an answer to this question or am I only spinning my wheels here and you're just, no matter what I say, is it going to be disregarded? As I've mentioned, I've already got people denouncing my videos, not because of the content. They're going through every single video. It's not they go through this content and go, I don't like that subject, and they click it off. They see my name, they go through, and they start clicking down unlikes just to decrease my view but my the views that i receive for these podcasts it's sabotage people are out there do not want you to know this information and yet you somebody says what's the point the point is not to let this happen and to actually do something about it and the only way to do something about it is if more people know about it information that's not shared has no value and if you think that keeping secrets, you think that these people staying in control is somehow an empowerment issue, that they're entitled to it, you're not the group I'm calling Americans. You're not. When I open my, my podcast and I say, greetings, my fellow Americans, I'm talking to people who actually care about this country and the principles it was founded upon. And if you think that being a lawyer or being in the government or being amongst the Fortune 500 companies out there makes you entitled to deprive 95% of the rest of the country of their rights and liberties, you are not an American. You are a traitor. Plain and simple, you're a traitor. You're a traitor to the founding fathers who fought for this country, the people who bled for this country, the vets who've gone across the, across the ocean and died for this country. You are a traitor. And to be called anything else is just a slur on everybody who's, who's died and sacrificed to get this country to where it is. And we are losing this country because of people like you. So if you're watching this and you don't believe that Americans are entitled to their civil liberties, that you think that you're entitled to some privilege that nobody else should have right to, you don't belong in this country. Go over to Saudi Arabia. Hey, you can have a harem with 50 wives. You can buy it. But you're not an American. Because you have to have an American values to be American. Citizenship aside, you are not the person I'm talking to. And I hope I'm talking to the other 95% out there who actually see this. But having said all this and expressed my outrage over this, I hope that you can see that this is actually very personal to me. And I hope you can see that it should be personal to you. And if you don't find it personal, then why are you watching this video and why do you care even whether or not, you know, your neighbor is hauled off in cuffs for something he didn't do? Why do you care if possibly your children are thrown in prison for crimes they didn't commit? Or worse... Your spouse is thrown into prison because she went to a school board meeting and, and spoke out against the governor and the governor didn't like that. It could happen. Are you going to let it? Corrupt power starts with suppression. It starts with misinformation. It starts with these very basic issues that my podcasts have been covering. 
I'm going to go bullet by bullet, by bullet point over my previous podcast and try to once again explain why they're important, what the significance of these subjects are, and how they relate to the Great Montana Conspiracy. And remember, it is a conspiracy. A conspiracy, by definition, is a group of people working towards one unlawful purpose. The suppression of civil liberties and taking away our civil rights is a crime. It's a horrific crime, and it's being done to you. And if you don't believe it's being done to you, then go to Canada, go to Vietnam, go somewhere else. But actually, if you care about America, if you care about this country, you need to do something about it. And that means you need to listen, and you need to speak out. And hey, if I'm wrong, if you can prove me wrong, if you can show, for instance, that, let's say, Supreme Court Justice Mike McGrath should, should, uh, should have been elected because the law that said he shouldn't have been elected because he held influence over legislation shouldn't apply to him because he's a good guy. Whatever, whatever your reason. If you think that anything I say or do on this podcast, by all means, talk to me, tell me. If it's anything other than just simple hate, which isn't going to get anywhere, I'll just delete your comments and move on. Because I'm not going to be bothered by it, and I'm not going to let the rest of the world be bothered by it, because it's ignorance. But if you have a genuine, legitimate issue, don't ask me what's the point. Actually ask me for a legitimate issue, and I will explain it, as I'm doing right now. And I hope you're listening, and I hope you do take enjoyment from these podcasts, and I'm hoping not offending anyone by saying this stuff, but it's just... It's frustrating because I, I see people who just take their, their civil liberties for granted. They think they have them, they'll always have them. And I used to be one of those people. I used to be one of those sheep until my liberties were taken from me. Niemöller was a pastor in 1930s Germany. Uh, he, was in, he, was, he fought in the war, World War I. He went over in the 1920s. He started doing his pastor work in the 1930s when the, the rise of the Third Reich and Nazism, he was a, he was a full-fledged supporter. He said, hey, I, I like what they're doing. I, I support it. I believe in this, this, this uh, cause. Until 1934. And he started seeing the systematic elimination of civil liberties. He started seeing the systematic problems. He started seeing the Gestapo police monitoring people's phone conversations, tapping communications, spying on people, starting to, to restrict and oversee and terrorize the populace who are not part of their structure. And that's when he started recognizing it's a totalitarianism, it's a despot that is being run in this country, and he needed to do something about it. He started speaking out then, but by then it was too late. He got thrown into concentration camp for seven years, and he was one of the lucky people to actually survive the concentration camp since millions of people didn't. But Reverend Niemöller was best known for the state for his quote, which says, first they came for the socialists, and I didn't have to speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I wasn't Jewish. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And he said this, in around 1946. Apparently he said it quite a lot. He repeated this poem or recitation in multiple speeches. So there's different versions of it out there. But the basic point is the same thing. He supported the government that took over with the Third Reich. He was a, an avid supporter and he said nothing when he saw these offenses happening because he was none of these. He wasn't a socialist. He wasn't a trade unionist. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a member of any of these other people that were being cast out or, or disenfranchised, had their liberty stripped, because it, it, was, it didn't matter to him. And maybe it doesn't matter to you. Maybe you sit here and you're watching this video and go, why does it matter? What's the point? It doesn't affect me. I've got $2.5 million. I've got a good job. I've got a good wife. I've got a good place in the community and society. I'm not doing anything wrong. They're not going to come after me. There's no reason for anyone to come after me. The government's not doesn't work like that. I'm living proof it does. I am living proof it does. And if you don't believe me, look up my record, look at my blog, look, read my book. You have to understand, this is not only a theory, it is real life. And I'm not the only person out here who's been treated like this. I'm just the one who's willing to speak. And believe me, every time I do this, I face anxiety and terror and I'm scared to death. I went to see my brother in jail the other day, on Sunday, actually it was yesterday. And I went to see him, 
And I go to the window and he says, oh, you know, all our positions are, all our slots are filled for 7 p.m. And by the way, in Flathead County Jail right now, they have three visits per hour instead of four because one of their phone systems is broke. In a population of over 100 people, three people an hour. Yeah, let's talk more about pretrial detention, how that's fair. But anyway, I went up to the jet, I went up to the cage, talked to the guard, and he says, well, eight o'clock is, seven o'clock position uh, slots are all filled. Um, I'll see if I can get you permission to come at the eight. Eight o'clock is usually for quarantine visits only, but I'll see, I'll go talk to my, my supervisor. And then he stops and says, and your name is Ron, right? Well, great, the guard knows my name, possibly, but why did he stop and ask me at that point in time if my name was Ron before he even went to get permission from his supervisor? As if who I was was going to affect whether I was going to get permission. Now, my thought, my fear at the time was... Is there, are they issuing a warrant for me? Are, are my podcasts actually getting retaliated against? That's, that's where my fear goes. I've been putting these podcasts out for a few weeks and suddenly the guard says, and your name is Ron, right? It'd be great if, if the world was a perfect place and you didn't have to worry about those things, but I have to worry about those things every single day. They've already tried to throw me back in prison twice. There's nothing stopping me from a new revocation attempt. And there's nothing to say they're going to warn me when they try. They didn't warn me the first time. They did warn me the second they gave me a chance to come in voluntarily. They did not warn me the first time. They showed up at my door, two probation officers, four cops with guns, ready to haul me off like I was some problem case. Never heard of anybody probation violated having that kind of a roll up. They walked me out. They wouldn't even let me put my shoes on. I had to walk out in April with snow on the ground, snow and ice on the ground, in my stocking feet, with arthritic joints, because they were afraid I was going to do something. Propaganda, misinformation. Once again, there it is. But my point is, I sit here and I do all this stuff and I say all these things and you don't think I live in fear? They've already taken my life away. They've taken away everything that's important to me. They've taken away my son. They've taken away my freedom. They've taken away my career, my ability to be self-sufficient. They've taken away everything from me. And why? Because they committed crimes and I sued them for those crimes. And I don't know how else to say it clearer than that. And I will do a podcast because I was reminded that I'm going into these podcasts with the expectation that everyone has had an opportunity to read my blogs, they've read my books, they know what my situation is, and I've alluded to it. I'll take a, take a moment and take a step back and actually do an entire brief run over of my history and what I've been through and why I'm doing this and why I'm saying these things and why I'm a U.S. political prisoner detained in Montana. But for now, just let's accept the fact that I am detained. I live in fear. I live in terror. And I've got two and a half years left before my 20-year sentence is up. And when that happens, and I'm, that every single day that passes, I worry they're going to try to find another way, a third, make a third attempt on my freedom and my liberty because I really don't think they want to let me free. They don't want to give me that, that chance. I mentioned in a previous video that I made an attempt at getting an early release and they shot it down, not because I've ever done anything wrong while on supervision, but because they just want an excuse to keep me detained, to keep me under their thumb, to keep me under these restrictions, to keep me from speaking, to keep me from doing all these things that they're worried about me doing. And I really don't think that in two and a half years, they're going to let me go, you know, say, okay, thanks, Mr. Glick. Have a good day and have a good life. They've tried twice. I have every expectation they're going to try a third time. And I have every reason to believe that these podcasts are going to be the impetus of it. But I got to speak while I can. And I thank Bill Russell for reminding me of that. So what's the point? Because that's the question. That's the core of this podcast. It's about our freedom. It's about how easily it can be taken and what it's being and what's being used to take it from us. It's not just one person sitting in a high tower and saying, I am going to sit here and I'm going to take this freedom away today. And I'm going to take that freedom away today. It is a group of people acting collectively. Whether you want to call it a secret society, 
not so secret because they, they call themselves lawyers, you know what they are, running and maintaining the, the backbone of a greater conspiracy of individuals who have money, who have influence, who have political office, and have and, and keep everyone in line with whatever their, their goals and agendas are. And in most cases, unfortunately, those aren't good agendas when they're left without supervision or oversight. And once again, these authorities I'm complaining about, these authorities who've done these things to me, have no oversight. There is no internal affairs department for the Kalispell Police Department. There is no internal affairs department for the, for the Flathead County Sheriff's Office, the, the County Commissioners. The Judicial Office has a supposed oversight, but that's a state level that I have made dozens of complaints to, never received a single response on. And it's just, it's not right. It, it's all pretense. What does exist is pretense. What And what the biggest problem is, is what doesn't exist. There is no independent oversight over these people. And without independent oversight, there's nothing restraining them from doing whatever they want. They control the media. They control the news. They control everything. They control the courts. They control everything. And how do you speak out about that? How do you stop that? I'm not going to go take a gun down and start blowing people away. That's not who I am. I know they want me to, so they can have a justification for everything they've done to me and say, okay, look, this is who we was all along. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to send threatening letters to the FBI. I'm not going to send any kind of, you know, threatening emails or harass people or show up on people's doorsteps with, you know, and I put a laser sight on somebody. That's, that's not who I am. They want me to be pushed to that point. They want me to, because then they can justify everything they've done to me. Mind you, it's eight, it's 17 years later. But hey, we can justify everything we've done because look what he is now, today. What we have made him, after all these years of harassment and terrorizing him and everything else, look what he's done, look what he's become. Well, I refuse to do that. I, re I refuse to let them push me to that point. And maybe someday that will change, but maybe someday I simply won't care about living anymore and I will do something suicidal like that, but it's not in my plan, it's not in my agenda, it's not, it's why I'm doing these videos. It's because I don't believe in that. I believe in the power of information. I believe in sharing it. And I believe that you are watching this will want to know these things because you need to know these things and you need to believe that they are true. So, let's talk about the previous topics of my of my podcast and we'll try to get to what the point is and what collects them all together my first topic was on pretrial detention and maybe it wasn't the greatest salvo to, to open my podcast but it was an important issue and, and by the way in that video I, I i looked it up afterwards because i was trying to recall it during the video and i completely messed it up and i said thomas jefferson made this quote well thomas jefferson to make this quote it was benjamin franklin and the actual quote is, it is better that it is better 100 guilty persons should escape than one innocent person should suffer. Is a maxim that has long and generally been approved. Benjamin Franklin, he said it in 1785. Now, he didn't create the thought. It was actually being echoing Voltaire and William Blackstone, 1747 and 1783, or so, yeah, respectively. And remember, Benjamin Franklin said it in 1785. But the idea being that when you can take an innocent person, a person who's not been convicted, who's not been proven of committing a crime, in a country where innocent until proven guilty is supposed to be the premise of our culture, and say it's justified to put them in jail, to cut off their, their, their income, to deprive them of home, of liberty, of freedom of association, to gouge them financially till they are broke beyond any measure, to put an excessive bail over them so high they can't possibly meet it without completely bankrupting themselves, and oftentimes, even then, every single person accused of a crime in Flyhead County is punished. Plain and simple. You don't have to be convicted to be punished. That's the point. You just have to be accused. You just have to say, you did this, so I'm going to put you in jail. And I'm going to keep you in jail under an excessively high bail that you cannot meet. Because then I can deprive, deplete your resources, deplete your money, deplete every, every your ability to even fight back, deplete your very will to fight back. Then I got you. 
that I got because you'll give in, you will break. And if you don't, I'll take you before trial after you've exhausted all your money, exhausted all your resources. Everyone out in, out in the general public now believes you're guilty because you've been in here for so long. Congratulations. Everything you had in life is gone, destroyed, obliterated. I got gotcha. you. So even if you walk away, or they manage to somehow walk away in Flathead County without a conviction, what do you return to? You have no life to return to. Everything is gone. Because you're punished pre-trial. And that's the significance there. That's why it's important. And that's the point. Because it can happen to anybody. And in Montana, it doesn't even require a grand jury to do this. It only requires a signed statement from a, from a prosecutor saying you committed this crime. The judge signs off on it. You're thrown in jail. Two individuals. That's it. Not 12, two. And guess what? I have never, ever, ever, and I've reviewed hundreds if not thousands of documents and people's cases as I've been a legal advocate inside the prison system and outside the prison system. I have never, ever, ever, ever seen where a prosecutor has submitted an information for issuing a warrant and it has not been issued by a judge. Never. Not once. I've never heard of a single case where someone is accused of a crime by a prosecutor, the information is taken to the judge and the judge does not sign it. So really all you need is one person because the judge is going to sign off on no matter what it says. It can say, I think that Jim Bob, <laughs> bringing Jim Bob back, Jim Bob, he killed his cat and he hung him out front carved his heart out in front, of a, in front of a schoolyard full of kids and then proceeded to eat it and spat the blood and intestines all over the children. Most horrific crime you can imagine. Maybe not the most horrific crime you can imagine. That's a pretty disgusting one to me. Didn't happen. Jim Bob was in, was in Missouri at the time, but all it takes is that prosecutor to sign a statement saying it's true. All it takes. Now, mind you, they don't follow the law. The law actually says that the information must be su provide, supported by actual evidence. But the only evidence that's ever submitted is a statement from the prosecutor. Prosecutor says it happened. Judge signs off on it. Go to jail. And once you're in jail, all your liberties are gone. As I said, every single person accused, they're punished. Before conviction of any crime, they're punished. There's a case, it was out of Florida in 1987. It actually defined this really well. It's actually been quoted in quite a few other cases I've read. It's called Hooks vs. Wainwright, and the actual notation is, is uh, 536 Federal Supplement. Um, and the quote of it is really important because it says, Prisoners are sent to prison as punishment, not to be punished course that decision says acts upon the presumption the person sent to prison or who's being confined is actually convicted of a crime so what happens when you get this happened to you before you even get convicted of a crime where's your rights where's your liberties they think they're justified because they have you where they want you and they can keep putting pressure on they can complete depleting you they can keep gouging you they can keep taking away every aspect of who you are and that's how they control their opponents. They destroyed it with me. I filed a lawsuit. That was my big crime, ladies and gentlemen. I did what the First Amendment allowed me to do. I filed a lawsuit against government, which I should have been able to do without fear of molestation, and instead I got thrown in jail. My life was obliterated. It was destroyed. I was detained for 16 months before I ever saw a trial. Meanwhile, they were out telling people the most horrific, horrific things about me, manufacturing threats against people who should have been willing to support my case. But no. I'm cut off. I can't talk to anyone. I don't, certainly don't have access to my business assets. Everything's gone. And 16 months later, they walk. They do a cakewalk through a through a you know scapegoat, hunk, you know kangaroo court, whatever you want to call it, and convicted me. And now here I am, 17 years later. Nothing's changed. I'm still detained. I'm. Just, everyone still believes I'm guilty because the prosecutor said so. It doesn't matter that. All the information they have is wrong. It doesn't matter that it's contradicted in half a dozen documents. It doesn't matter. 
I had a my lawyer, my first lawyer, Edward Gutierrez Faya. And by the way, anyone who wants to look that up, it's spelled F-A-L-L-A. He told me that if I'm convicted, it's a truth. It's absolute truth. It's absolute solid because the court said so. Yeah. It is what it is. I said that a lot. But anyway, my next uh, podcast was on presumed guilt. The conditional response. It is a conditional response. It's a conditioned response that says, if you're accused of a crime, the general public presumes you're guilty. Your name gets blasted all over the newspaper, the news media, the television. Trust me, the local news station, they carry your arrests. They have an entire segment dedicated to people who show up in court and what they're accused of. You have a pretty good chance that you're going to end up on, on, on your local television station and everybody you know is going to see it. You're arrested, you're in there, and the point is you're kept in there. And that presumed guilt is what works against you and this conditioned response that people have and it gets ingrained in you by, by the TV media, by the police, by politicians. They all endorse that imprisoning you before trial, once again going back to the, the presumption of pretrial detention, helps enforce the idea that you are guilty. And so long as you work off the idea that you're guilty before you ever get convicted, you, you can't. You, there's no way to defend against that. They can destroy anybody's reputation. They can accuse anyone of anything, throw them in jail, accuse them, and the presumption of basic society is that you're guilty because you've been accused. Why? Because everyone in Flathead County who gets accused goes to prison. There's, there's no national statistics to support that a prosecutor can be right 100% of the time. It's simply inhumanly impossible. Unless you manipulate the system, unless you make sure... You get to hold people as long as you want to. You get to do whatever you want. You get to, you have the judges in your pocket. Yeah, everything. It goes your way. You get to be controlling everything that the people hear because you control what the news media hears. You control what gets out to the witnesses. You control what gets out to the, alleged, if there's any alleged victims. You control it all. The, vic, the person who's in jail, the person who truly is being victimized here, has no voice. You see these things on, on television shows and news media all the time where this big highfalutin lawyer gets up and says for his client, I'm, I'm making a press conference for my client and my client is, is innocent and, and here's his defense. And da, da, da. You never see that here. Never. Why? Because the prosecutors, and the, they're the ones who run the show. The defense lawyers all work for them. You can be having them as a public defender or you can have them as, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars paid out of pocket to them to keep them and retain them. 90% of the time, those people work for the court because guess what? They have to continue practicing in this jurisdiction. I recently was working with, a, with somebody who had, they have a child custody issue and the local court, Judge Wilson, flagrantly defied the law. And I'm not going to go on the case and specifics right now, but it just, there's no mistake. He flagrantly violated the law. He did so because he can. And he liked the attorney who was who was prosecuting the case for whatever reason. He liked the fact that the person prosecuting the case had money. Didn't matter that he didn't have jurisdiction. It was a case pending in California. Had no jurisdiction. No jurisdiction. Child was not in Montana. Had not been in Montana for two years. Had no jurisdiction. Still ruled issues. Still did everything. And an attorney gets brought in and says, okay, we need to we need to raise a challenge and challenge the fact that there is fraud on the court. The judge himself committed fraud on the court by disregarding the law, disregarding his jurisdiction. He was informed of it. He knew of it. He still did it. Her response? I still have to practice here. She's more concerned with her individual practice than raising a claim of judicial misconduct. And that's how every single lawyer here works. In order to practice in Flyhead County, you have to... I, I don't want to cuss on my podcast, but you have to kiss them. 
And you know what I'm talking about. Not on the lips. And that's why presumed guilt is such a problem. Because if these people, if these corrupt officials control the public's perception of what's innocent and what's guilty, there is no hope of, of ever getting free of this. Because these very people are going to be who your jury pool is pulled from. They've already been tainted. They've tainted the general public every single time there's a case. It gets blasted all over the newspapers. It gets blasted all over the, the, new, the, the uh, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock news. They have an entire segment dedicated to this. So why wouldn't the presumption of guilt be predominant over the presumption of innocence? Why shouldn't it? Because that's not the way it's supposed to work. And that's how people lose their liberty. That's how people lose their rights. It's because if anyone, whether it be just a simple person or a political opponent or anybody else, is thrown into prison on the basis of, I don't like them or I just don't care if it's true or not, we can't go as a culture off presumed guilt. We can't. It doesn't work that way, and it can't work that way in a democracy. So what's the point? The point is, what's to stop it from happening to you? If you get accused of a crime, who's out there who's going to be advocating for you? Who's going to be speaking to the public for you? Who's going to convince the public and counter the instilled supposed trust you have in government? If you automatically believe the government and presume that if they accuse someone of a crime, they must be guilty, there's a problem. And you've got to see that in order to proceed. You have to. Or you open up the possibility you yourself could go through it yourself and you have no defense because you sat back while it happened to everybody else. So my next topic was on unpublished opinions. And this was a much broader topic and much more of a statewide issue. Um, and definitely dealing with, with how Montana keeps its corruption under control. But this deals with the enforcement of law, or the lack thereof, in Montana. If a judge says, I don't like you because you're black. I don't like you because you're from California. I don't like you. Hey, I, I've got a, an option in, in a business as, as a rival of yours. I don't like you. It doesn't matter doesn't matter what the reasoning is, what the rationality is. Maybe they just want to have convictions, more convictions than, than innocence being proven in their court. When it goes up to the state, state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court can say, I don't have to follow the law. I can issue an unpublished opinion, and in the unpublished opinion, I can say whatever I want. I can see that being black is a sin in God's eyes. It doesn't matter. By the way, I don't believe that. Just, just to be clear, I don't believe that for a second. We're all equal. We're all innocent. It doesn't matter what our, our skin tone is, our race, our, our religion, anything. We're all human. We're all equal. That's what I believe. But if you get a biased or a prejudiced judge, or you get somebody who's like that in a position of power and influence, and you have... A Supreme Court that says, okay, I know that opinion doesn't jive with law, but we're not going to shut down our judges. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to make people believe that they're not all powerful and all knowing. We're going to make sure we support them, regardless of how bad that decision is, regardless of how many precedents it violates, regardless of how many civil liberties it overturns. But we're going to use unpublished opinions because then it won't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. It just doesn't matter. We will publish the law tomorrow. We'll say what we're going to say today. But tomorrow you can't even reference what we say today because it's an unpublished opinion. This, in, this permits invidious discrimination. It protects Montana from external review because none of these unpublished opinions are cataloged anywhere outside of the court. They're not publicized. They're not separated for public consumption. There's no publicity attached to them. None. Zero. Not it. The only place they exist is in the court dock, and if you don't know to look for them, you don't know they're there. This literally serves as a means of suppressing civil liberty on a case-by-case -case basis across the state. It just does. There's just no other way to look at it. These cases are never reviewed. They're unpublished opinions. They don't matter for purposes of, of you know, it doesn't matter. 
It's, they're not presidential. They don't have any influence over future decisions. They're not issues that the Supreme Court wants, that the U.S. Supreme Court wants to take up because they're unpublished opinions. The Supreme Court's concerned about precedent, about what laws affect the entire country. Laws that don't affect the entire anybody don't raise to their level of concern. And I've tried to bring these cases a half dozen times before the U.S. Supreme Court and been shot down every time. Of course, they never rule on the subject matter. They never say, oh, this is, you know, this is unconstitutional or this is not unconstitutional or this is right or wrong. They just say, well, we're not going to take it up. They don't make a decision on the validity of the, of the claim. They just don't pick it up. Why? Because it doesn't affect anybody. It doesn't affect the majority of anybody because it, it's designed to affect one party. One person, one company, what, whoever. It's not a precedent. It doesn't set a precedential value. And therefore, the U.S. Supreme Court does not take up these cases. Never reviewed. And they can ignore the law, and they can ignore the Constitution, and they can ignore everything about it. A judge can say, I want his hand cut off as a consequence because he stole a, a package of Pop Rocks. And the Montana Supreme Court would uphold it. And they'll uphold it not by a, a presidential decision. They'll uphold it through an unpublished opinion because that way it doesn't get, get challenged and the person's hand gets cut off and what's what done then? In Montana, chances are the stay wouldn't even be granted pending. His, his hand would probably all be chopped up by the time the Supreme Court even saw him because they never grant stays on, on procedures. But that's the problem. When you have a, a, a court that is so powerful that it has absolutely no restraint, and it keeps the courts of the state in the same issue. Which brings us to the next issue and why it's so critically important. That was the next topic was unauthorized practice of law. And this just opens up the can of worms. This is, this is about suppressing opposition. This is about saying we get to control who is a lawyer, who is not a lawyer. We can decide if there's anybody who challenges us. We can decide if what they're doing is illegal. We can make sure that someone doesn't represent a group of people or anybody else because they're not lawyers. We can make sure that we can control people both inside and outside the alleged profession of lawyers. We have an office of disciplinary counsel to make sure that our lawyers actually toe the line and, and keep in line with what we want them to be. Mind you, those rules are ignored on a regular basis. Complaints are ignored. The only reason that Office of Disciplinary Council exists is to punish people who don't conform with the good old boy network or the, how the powers that be want them to perform. I.e., I'm going to stand up to judges. I'm going to stand up and, and call out people publicly for their criminal misconduct in office. You're no longer a lawyer. We get to take your license away. You're not going to practice law in Montana anymore. And then they have the Commission on Practice, which, of course, was dissolved, but now that same practice regardless of the commissioner or otherwise, is now being handled by the Department of Justice, the Office of Consumer Protection. Same office, or same duties, same responsibilities, same enforcement of the same corrupt law. Why does it matter? What's the point? <laughs> and, and if you don't understand the point here, I don't know what to tell you. This is such a critical issue. You have what it literally amounts to a not-so-secret society who calls themselves lawyers and attorneys who get to control every aspect of your lives and decide whether you even have a right to challenge anything done to you. And remember, in Montana, to be a judge, you have to be a lawyer. So you already have to be pre-approved by the powers that be in this state, adhere to their standards, and then you get to be a judge, which means the entire third branch of government, supposedly, you know, an entire third of our government, our state government, is every single one of them are lawyers. Every single one of them. You can't be a judge in Montana and not be a lawyer. So an entire one third branch of our government is consisted of these individuals, this one practice, this one group of people, this one profession, control an entire third of our government. And if that isn't scary in and of itself, that you have a secret organization that calls themselves lawyers but actually operates on a completely different plane and of what's right and what's wrong, 
and they are in control. It's like, say, okay, the Catholics, we're going to create a branch of government, and the Catholics are going to control it all. Nothing wrong with Catholics, by the way. Nothing wrong with Catholics. I've known many good Catholics and many bad Catholics. Nothing to say against Catholicism. I'm only using it as an example. One religious group who's obviously, by its very nature, going to be exclusionary of any other religious group or any other people that don't conform to their beliefs. Atheism, out the window. Hinduism, out the window. Not recognized anywhere else because Catholics run it. It's just the nature of the beast. It's not saying that Catholics are bad people, but they're going to support their own beliefs and their own philosophy, and they're going to make rules based upon their criteria. Abortion, out the window. Catholics don't believe in it. Birth control, out the window. Catholics don't believe in it. An entire third of the government controlled by one select group of people. Entire third, one third. And then, surprise, surprise, these attorneys also end up in other offices. They end up in governor's positions. They end up in elected positions throughout the executive branch and throughout the legislative branch, which means probably if you did a, a, a breakdown and count of the number of elected officials, appointed officials, and whatever in all three branches, over half of them would be lawyers. Over half would be lawyers. And these are the people who have exclusive right to do whatever they want to do within the boundaries of what the Montana law says. And no one else can. This is elitism at its worst. What's the point? Seriously, what's the point? You have an elitist group of people who are above the law, who don't suffer proper restrictions or limitations, they don't have proper oversight, they run the judiciary, they don't have any anyone overseeing them or questioning their misconduct. In fact, you have an entire Supreme Court that endorses their misconduct and hides it behind unpublished opinions. What's wrong with this? What's the point? The point is you have a corrupt profession that violates the Sherman Antitrust Act and they're running the government. They are literally running our government. And they're corrupt and unsupervised and, un un and unrestrained. That's the point. Law and practice is so broad, it can and does suppress organized opposition. It restricts any one person from speaking, speaking out on behalf of a group of disenfranchised individuals. It forces individual, individualism versus organized change. And keep in mind, these lawyers, these attorneys are organized. Remember, they run government. And even when they don't run government, they have their own little bar association they have, they're all members of. They have their own country clubs they, they're members of. They have their own private little powwows, conversations. They all support each other. They are the backbone of corruption in the state of Montana. There was somebody who commented to one of my videos who called this, who called attorneys the biggest crime organization in the state. I don't disagree. I, I completely endorse that statement. It said, nevertheless, when you have a situation to where you have a branch of government, or for that matter, the majority of government, completely controlled and dominated by a group of people that by law are allowed to do whatever they want to do and can keep anyone else from doing that, that's a problem. And especially when they utilize that power for corrupt personal gain. That's the point. Which leads us into censorship, which is another topic I covered. If government gets to control what is said, heard, or read, they get to control whether the public even learns about their misconduct. They keep damaging information out of the press. What a great racket. I can go hit a pedestrian, and I'm going to control whether the, the, courts even, the courts even ever prosecute me for it. I've told this story before. Lori Adams, who was the prosecutor in my case, who only handled sex offender cases, only, only, rolled her truck on the highway after being drunk. Got a DUI only because there was just no way to hide it. I mean, this wasn't a matter of a police officer pulling her over and saying, oh, I, I see who, are, who you are, Judge Adams. We're going to take you home. Don't worry about it. 
and hiding it. She rolled a truck, caused a traffic accident, truck caused an incident. It was kind of hard to hide that. So what do they do? They don't prosecute her. She never faces actual charges for this. She never gets cited. She never gets an information brought against her. She never goes to jail. The only thing that happens is the prosecutor's office, who she was working for at that point in time, says, you just don't get to prosecute DUIs for a year. She's not prosecuting DUIs. She's prosecuting sex offenses. She's absolutely not affected in the least, has nothing on her record, has nothing, never goes to jail, never faces a consequence. She rolled her vehicle. She rolled her vehicle across a lane of traffic, reckless driving, which is a felony. Or actually, I think it might be a misdemeanor. Depending on the damage level, it's either a misdemeanor or a felony. But regardless, it's a crime. DUI, a crime. She is an officer of the court who never faces consequences. Instead, she gets promoted. She's a city judge. And they control the censorship by making it sound like, oh, she's been punished. She gets to do whatever she wants. They control what is seen, what is heard, what is done. They made it sound like she was justified because, oh, we just gave her a slap on the wrist. They control the information. They spun it. And the problem is that even if someone had witnessed this, even if someone had recorded this, oh, I'm recording... Judge Lori Adams on the side of the road, drunk, can't stand, has rolled her vehicle. The person recording that would have committed a crime because in Montana, it's illegal to record somebody if they don't know they're being recorded. Censorship. But if the police cannot be viewed committing the crimes they commit, if law enforcement, government, people of influence are allowed to hide what they're doing because it's illegal to even record what they're doing, how are we ever going to expose that corruption exists here? Every other major issue across the country has been based upon a video being recorded, whether it be Rodney King or Floyd or whoever. Every single case we've seen over the last 20 years or more, 30 years, has been because it's been recorded. Something that's illegal to do in Montana. We cannot catch people in the act because we can't record them. We cannot use electronic information or electronic devices to record them. If we do, we're criminals ourselves. We're convicted. We're thrown in jail. The information is confiscated by the police. What's the point? Really? The point is that we can't do this. We can't allow a government where we're a democracy not have some accountability to the general public of which it serves. And if we can't even record them, if they get to choose what we say, what we can't say, what we can view, what we cannot view, who's believed when it's, when, when it's just the police saying this is what happened and a person who's in jail and behind bars saying this is what happened? Right back to the presumed guilt. Right back to the pretrial detention. Which, of course, gets us right back to misinformation, which is the next podcast I, I brought up. As with censorship, when the government controls the script, when they get to decide what's the truth and what's not, they get to tell lies without any proof. There's no consequence under the law for them to, for them to be caught lying. There is no liberty. Because they get to control what you see and what you hear, and they get to control whether or not you even believe what you see and hear. Bad guys do not tell the truth. I think everyone can agree with that. Criminals lie. I think everyone can agree with that. So when do you flip the script and start seeing the people who lie are the bad guys? If the government is lying, they are the bad guys. They are the criminals. Good people don't have a reason to lie. That's the bottom line. That's the point. Why is misinformation important? Because if the government is allowed to lie, then they are not good people. They are criminals. And they should be prosecuted and they should be held accountable. Because for crying out loud, if I lie to the government, I'm going to jail. So why should the government go to jail if they lie to me? And why is the government so opposed to ethical oversight? 
why is there not a an internal affairs for the police department, sheriff's department, county attorney's office, anybody in in, in state or, or in the city or, or, or Flathead County government? Where is it? We have a state ethics board. They never come in here and do anything in Flathead County. We have no state oversight. We have nothing. Flathead County is allowed to do whatever it wants to do within Flathead County. There's a problem. So, overall, what's the point? What's the point of all of this? What's the point of the Great Montana Conspiracy? The point is that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And in Montana, authorities have absolute power. They have neither restraint nor compulsion to be honest. They have no consequences if they lie. They have no consequences if they commit crimes. They have complete control of the courts, an entire third of our government, not to mention the, the, the attorneys and lawyers who overlap into the other branches of government and control the majority of the government. They have the power to do whatever they want. They can throw anyone in jail. They've got the, the people eating out of the palm of their hand, believing that the person thrown in jail is there for a justifiable reason, even if they're not. So, what's the point? And I, and I keep saying, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? Well, the bottom line is, what happened to me can happen to you, can happen to your friends, can happen to your mom, can happen to your 90-year-old grandma. Because there's nothing stopping them. What's to stop them? What is to stop them? If they do this to you, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your family, what's to stop them? Look at my situation. Look at my circumstances. What stopped them with me? You need to speak out now because that's the point. You need to believe this is going on. This is not hypothetical. This is not theoretical. This is not a philosophy class. This is real world. And if you care about America, if you care about our values, if you care about the democracy, and you care about your fellow Americans, then you'll take what I say to heart and you'll do something about it. Niemöller did this. Did this. He endorsed a corrupt political regime. And by the time he spoke up, there was no one left to speak for him because everybody was already disenfranchised. And he went to, and lived in a concentration camp for seven years. And he was one of the lucky people to walk out of a concentration camp and live into post-war. Millions of people didn't. So what's to stop them here? That's the question, isn't it? Do you think you have an answer? Please, by all means, let me know. If you think that what happened to me happens to you and you don't and you aren't going to have to be affected like this, tell me why. Tell me why you think that you will not be affected the way I was affected. That you could be an innocent person charged with a crime you did not commit suffer in prison, suffer in jail, have your entire life stripped from you. You tell me, by all means, please tell me, what's the point? You tell me what the point is, what you think my point needs to be, or what, or where I'm failing to get the point across. Because I want to hear, I need to know, so I can help explain it, because this is very important to me, and I think I'm passionate about it, and I think you should be passionate about it. And I hope you will be passionate about it, and you will share this video with everyone else. Because this video is important. Probably, a lot more important than anything else I've put together, because it is. As always, as I wrap this up, please support the program. This video is available primarily and broadcast through Podbean, which is monspiracy.podbean.com. I'm trying to focus my attention primarily onto YouTube, so please follow, or in the terms of YouTube, subscribe, and please share. Please share with anybody and everybody because this is an important issue. All of these issues are important. All these important issues are critical. I need your support. I need your help not only in broadcasting this information, though, and as I've said this before, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with this part about it, but let's face it, I'm recording with an iPhone 8, and I'm sure you've detected the quality. It's not that fantastic. It's not that great. The video quality is actually pretty good. Thank you, iPhone. Thank you, Apple. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's still an iPhone. There's no way to really do a whole lot with it. I get to record it. If I try to interview somebody, I've got a little bitty box right here in the corner. It would take up about, oh, eh, about that, less than that part of the screen. I'm putting my thumb, my finger in front of the screen. Less than that. That's how big the screen, the screen size is for this iPhone 8. I don't need to be able to split the screen. Maybe they allow that with other later editions of iPhone, but I don't have it with mine. So as you can tell, I can't really do interviews. I can't really do a lot of like here's a here's an image of something I have posted. I don't have the editing software for that, the computer for that. 
I don't have a recording studio. I don't have any of the resources that a lot of podcasters have. I just don't have them. So if you want to help support this program, you want to help make it bigger, make it better, please, by all means, support us. And I'm not asking necessarily for money, although money is great. Information on how to do so is in my description. Resources. Send me resources. Send me information. Information is, is, is my bread and butter. Give me information on something you've gone through, something you've experienced, something you've witnessed. By all means, I'd be glad to take your information and run with it. If I can verify it, if I can validify it, I'm not going to simply be a springboard for every person who's accused of a crime who wants to get out of a, con of a conviction to which they're due. I very much believe in our justice system, despite how it may sound, so long as it's punishing those who are genuinely deserving of punishment. But I do not believe that the system should be used to punish anybody and everybody the state feels just so they can advance their own political careers or agendas. The government's supposed to be working for us, not the other way around. So, by all means, please help us support us. Material donations, financial donations, buy my books. The U.S. Political Prisoner since 2004 is the story of my, my experience here. By all means, buy it. Any sales or or uh, income received from it is automatically going to be funneled into this, into this podcast. If you want to buy any of my other books, I've written 23 other books, 10 novels, 12 trivia books, and one other nonfiction. And you want that money to be devoted towards this? By all means, send me an email. Say, hey, I want this information. Go to my website, ronglick.com. You can request, send a request to me. Hey, I'm buying The Wizard in Wonderland, and I want the sales of this book to go to support your Great Montana Conspiracy podcast. Absolutely. I will divert the money. Gladly. As I've mentioned before, I don't earn a lot of this anyway. I don't, I mean, I'm lucky if I bring in 20 bucks a month. It goes towards print copies of books that I distribute out to try to raise awareness of my books and for people to read my books. So it's not something, I'm not living off it by any stretch of the imagination. I don't earn a great income. Diverting a buck here, a buck there, not going to make or break my efforts to try to re reprint copies of books to get them distributed. So I don't have a problem diverting the money. Request it, I'll do it. If there's something I can do that will get you to support me, let me know. I, I, I want to hear. I want feedback. Obviously, this entire video is because I received feedback that I felt needed to be addressed. So I'm not not listening to you. I am. I very much want to get my points across, and I very much want you to listen, and I want you to know I'm listening when you send information back to me. So, having said all that, once again, I do hope that everyone out there had a wonderful and safe holiday. As I mentioned, once again, we are coming off of the Labor Day holiday. And... Of course, as always, whenever possible, please be free. Thank you.